I V M. Hey everybody, quick request once again, if you could help us out by filling out our survey, it's at ivmpodcast.com slash survey. This really helps us talk to advertisers about the kinds of people listening to these shows. Really do appreciate your help and we're going to be doing a random drawing and we'll be sending out some IVM swag. Hope you enjoy that. Hello and welcome to The Wired Talks. I'm Siddharth Bhatia. For the past month and a half, thousands of farmers from Punjab and Haryana have been camping on the borders of Delhi to protest against the three new farm laws passed by the Narendra Modi government. The farmers feel that these laws favor big corporate buyers and will cut into their incomes. They want these laws completely repealed. But are these protests only about incomes? To understand the other complexities of why the farmers are protesting, we talked to Dr. Pritam Singh, Professor Emeritus at Oxford Brooks Business School in Oxford. Dr. Singh has a DPhil from the University of Oxford and has written a critically acclaimed book, Federalism, Nationalism and Development, India and the Punjab Economy. Dr. Singh, welcome to Wire Talks. Thank you, Siddharth. A pleasure to talk to you. Okay, so, you know, the farmers have been in the news. They are, uh, they've converged uh, on the borders of Delhi in bitter winter. It's raining. They are now under tents. They are making food, langar. They are being, uh, you know, very peaceful. And the newspapers have been covering uh, the daily activities and talking about their demands. Yes. But there's much more to just what they are asking for, isn't it? It's not only about saying repeal so that we can save our incomes. It's much more than that, isn't it? It's a question of, you know, cultural question. There is a context. There is a question of identity. And in fact, a sense of belonging to the land also. So why don't you give us in brief a kind of overview of what the protests uh, are about as you see it? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, um, you're very right that... uh This is not only an economic issue, though that is at the moment quite central, but there are other uh, issues, political, cultural, historical, and and so on and so forth. The economic question is, of course, very, very important, because as you know, that when the Green Revolution was launched, the minimum sport price and public procurement was absolutely central to that. If I may say that it's a package of three things. One, minimum sport price second, compulsory public procurement, and third, timely procurement. And if one of these things are taken away, the package doesn't work. For example, if you have the MSP, but you don't have compulsory procurement, it doesn't work. Similarly, if you have the MSP and the compulsory procurement, but not a timely procurement, that also doesn't work. And and like there was a very interesting instance in Madhya Pradesh, where the, the MSP was there for the vegetables, there was also a procurement, but it wasn't done timely. And perishable commodity like vegetables, they rot. So the farmers were feeding vegetables, cauliflowers, and aubergine to the animals. So um, when the Green Revolution was launched, the purpose was to attain food self-sufficiency because that was absolutely crucial to, to, to India's sense, sense of being a nation which is independent, not dependent. And this worked. And India gained food self-sufficiency by early 70s. And in fact, now India exports rice and even wheat, but many times it's a damaged wheat, but still it is expo- it's able to export that. The taking away of that uh, package, which is what is uh, you know included in these uh, the three laws, suddenly shook the peasantry in Punjab and Haryana. And it's not only Punjab and Haryana. To some extent, this happens also in Western UP and parts of Rajasthan, and parts of Madhya Pradesh, but more systematically in Punjab and Haryana. So one was this, that, oh God, what will we do? I mean, you know, that that is an assured income. And that that applies to all sections of the farmers, not only the rich farmers. Sometimes it is misunderstood that it's only the rich farmers. Even a farmer who has two acres or five acres of land, he or she knows that if he produces wheat and rice, it's going to be procured and the price at which it's going to be procured will be also given because that's announced in advance before the farmer sows those uh, crops. And it will be done systematically because there's a mandi provided by the by the state. So when they saw that that's going to happen, 
they suddenly thought, what will happen? You know, our, our crops will not be uh, sold and, and what will we do? So it looked like a complete economic ruin. So that was one. Second, some organizations which were more aware of the political economy of the whole thing, they also understood that this is a major attack on the state's federal rights in agriculture. Because in the Indian constitution, agriculture is a state subject. And uh, there are three subjects which these days people know about it. There's the center, there is a concurrent list, and there's a state list. And the concurrent list has some you know, laws, some items on which both the center and the state can pass laws. And if there is a conflict, the overriding clause is the center's act will uh, uh, be implemented. Now, the, there is a clause called trade in that. And the central government is using that as a, as a motive. But the farmers were extremely worried that if this goes through, that opens the avenue for the center to maximally you know, intrude into the agriculture fairs and many more will come. So this is a major attack on the state's rights. And that also led to protest by regional political parties, you know, that, oh my God, I mean, this is one by one centralization is kind of coming into, and now this was, this was a protected uh, field, and it's a major intervention which is being made. So basically, you are saying that uh, federalism has also entered the uh, equation because now Punjab, Haryana and other states are saying that we are, our rights are being taken away. Yes. And, and that too on something so important. Yes, yes, absolutely. So that's why every party, including the Akalis, yeah. who otherwise were allies of the BJP, yes. have also protested and walked away. Yes, yes. So this is this is quite an important uh, aspect to know, yeah. if you can uh, tell us about the federal uh, argument. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the... Federal argument is that the India's constitution is centrally biased, precisely because even if there is a division of power between the center and the states, the concurrent list provides an avenue for the center to use some of the items in the concurrent list to intrude into even the state affairs. And and my book I have discussed in great detail that how center has been intruding one after the other. It happened during emergency. Mindra Gandhi brought education out of the state list into the concurrent list. It brought forests out of the state list into the concurrent list. And that has been going on. And it's very interesting that non-Congress governments have come into power, but they did not undo the things which were done during the emergency to take away the rights of the states. So the two main parties, the BJP and the Congress, both are very centralist in their orientation. Though the, uh, their variant orientation is different. The Congress orientation was to build India into one unified nation, weaken regional identities and you know, make one nation. And, and BJP is taking the same agenda, but trying to make into Hindu uh, nation. So there has been a political agenda behind this uh, weakening of the states. The third is that the decision makers, whether it's a top bureaucracy or the political leadership or the top business class, they also don't want states to have too many rights. They want one uniform Indian market. Okay, so there's the pressure from them. And within the Indian administrative system, the IES is a very centrally oriented administrative service. I mean, in my book, I found when I was doing the search that many of the officers at the state level who are from the IES cadre sometimes do not push forward the state's agenda because they're hoping to be also employed in the center. You know, that is the top, top job. So the whole structure is built in such a way that centralization is being uh, speeded up. This really alarmed the, the regional parties. And it's not only the Punjab and Haryana regional parties. It is, uh, you know, parties in Tamil Nadu, in Andhra Pradesh, even CPM, which has woken up in Kerala, in Bengal. So regional parties woke up that, oh my God, this is this is a big thing. It's not only an economic issue, it is also a political issue and combination of economic and political issue. So it, it became, but interestingly, this has not come up in the national agenda. In, I mean, in the negotiations, this is not coming up. The farmer's leadership is quite aware of this. The, the some of my, One of the most articulate leaders, the Bilbir Singh Rajewal, he's been constantly bringing this up. And there is a Punjabi saying, which I am sure we can translate, which means that I'm not worried about the rabbit. I'm worried about the path the rabbit is going to create, that even if these laws are passed, it might be rabbit. But once this opens, it will create new avenues. I'll give you one example. 
that one of the things in this laws is that there will be uh, markets outside the state controlled mandis and these markets will be under the central law so you will have two markets one the state regulated market which is where the minimum sport price is there and public procurement and outside that there is another market which is regulated by the central laws it's a complete recipe for disaster so so you 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 have two laws two markets operating at the same time it was another way of looking at the intrusion into the market mechanism apart from the political parties uh, regional political parties everywhere yeah one saw in the punjab context and also in haryana perhaps elsewhere too that all kinds of members of civil society as well as other fields sports literature actors uh, theater artists people who otherwise in other contexts have nothing to do with agriculture per se yes. coming forward with their support taking it up on social media defending uh, the farmers participating yeah. now clearly this is something that cuts deep into punjabi society let's talk about punjab for a minute it cuts d- deeply into punjabi society and from an au- outside perspective i would say that's perhaps because the farmer is embedded in the daily life of punjab yeah. the farmer yeah. is not a farmer the farmer yeah. is part of the fabric yes so yes. this this requires a little bit of explanation for our uh, listeners yeah yeah no no you are very right that post independence no movement whether in punjab or outside have seen such a massive mobilization from different quarters totally unexpected quarters people who work in bollywood has nothing to do with they being uh, upset by this and massively openly participating in this the reason is that one of course the question of agriculture the other is a question of the village village is a very important people's imagination because people might be a film actor in mumbai or a doctor in in delhi or a surgeon in calcutta but somewhere they have the notion that maybe i don't have a connection with the village my by grandfather had there are memories that you go and see your nani and and spend the you know sort of holidays in the village so there is there is uh, and it's not totally romantic it is something to do with your link with the previous generations and it looked like that that village society will be you know totally uprooted and big farms will come up they will cultivate it in farms of 1000 acres and this population will be uprooted and thrown into the cities and all that image that you go once in a while to your village and this happens with the diaspora that's why diaspora is so much uh, upset and because many of them have roots in the villages and that village is a part of the imagination a part of the poetry part of the culture which they have understood part of the songs they they use the word hond which is a punjabi word for existence that is an existentialist crisis it's not merely an economic crisis it is an existential crisis that a whole civilization will be totally upset down and that's what led to that upsurge where where people have come out without any conditions and are willing to give their lives they are saying that it's a question of future generations and that's why you know women have come out dalits have come out uh, farmers have come out traders have come out the most amazing thing in in this moment is that the city population which normally is not involved in many you know active political organizations they have also got active part of that is economic interest because the commission agents the rtas who are the traders they know that their interests will be also hit but also other people who might be you know sort of in the cities but somewhere the other they can also trace their village roots so it is a village which is a part of their cultural memory and it has a romantic uh, association but it goes beyond that it's a question of your memory it's your question of your existence how you see your identity in terms of that so it looked like that whole oh, it's a civilizational crisis almost and that's led to this is kind of unprecedented uh, upsurge in the population and and that show the determination and also the mobilization has led to new identities how people have you know overcome all the inhibitions people who have never cleaned toilets people who have never bothered to you know clean sweep the houses they are doing this men are doing cooking 
and women are driving tractors and there is a noise just in the when the langar is being prepared and and served the caste distinctions just melt away and the love which they have got from the haryana farmers from the villages it is this you know it is this kind of upsurge of emotions of solidarity affection love which is totally opposite to what this law were presenting this law were presenting alienation being being taken over being you know relegated into total migrants in the urban areas where we do not know what kind of employment you will generate so that's why it's it's a multifaceted uh, a protest but of course the economic dimension is very very important you mentioned the village and the village is not just pure nostalgia it is also kind of uh, a social structure isn't it and the farmer is in a sense central to that imagination wouldn't you say yes absolutely farmer is because he he or she is the producer mainly he i mean of course there is some change taking place and uh, in poetry you see you know there is a very famous uh, poem called sade khute vasda rabni that the god lives on our well because there is a water and there is a music of the entering of the well and therefore farmer is associated with the land you know and farmer is an image that we are rooted in this civilization this history and this has a long history you know right from uh, the the birth of sikhism to the period of the colonial rule and and post colonial rule the birth of peasant movements which have come after one after the other farmer has been at the backbone of of political movements of cultural movements and the culture which has come up from that you know the writings you know novels short stories plays songs which have emerged from that and farmer has been central to that therefore people who you know in terms of caste are not defined farmer they also identified farmer for example you will hardly see this brahman jat you know that what is a brahman jat person might be brahman by caste but he or she is a farmer okay and a baniya jat it is very interesting that baniya is a trader but he is also associated with so they feel pride in that association now the word jat is a double meaning one is of course in terms of caste and which sometime is is it has a negative connotation but jat is also a farmer you know and haryana they call them jat or in rajasthan and up they call jat but it is also a metaphor for farming it's not only the caste it is the profession which they do and that has all the elements of this you know the the all the other professions which are linked with whether it's a carpenter or a blacksmith or one who you know grind the well all this are connected so farming is is kind of central to the way of life which the village has and i'm very right that it is associated with the conception of the farmer and one who works so hard that there is a rainfall there is a snowfall there is a very very high winds there are dust storms but he or she still works and the songs does you know celebrate how the women in the villages who cook food they take the food to the farm so she is also associated with the farm so farm is looked upon in sense of purity you know that he produces food for all of us he produces milk for all, all of us he produces our essential commodities despite all the hardships which he or she has to go through because of the weather conditions crop disease and the adversities of nature which he or she faces so when you mention the idea of uh, caste yeah that there is a brahman jat and there is a baniya jat yeah where do in this entire thing because there is a large community population which is dalit where do dalits fit into this now dalit issue is extremely important both to understand the strength of this movement and also the fault line to some extent there is a tension in the villages and sometimes this is overplayed but sometimes it is underplayed as well that the jat farmers in punjab majority of them are six they are not all six and that is also sometime misinterpreted that the farmers are also rajputs they are also sanis they are also kambos they are also rai six there are brahmans who are also farmers but majority of them comes from a sikh jat sikh uh, uh, background they have a tension with the dalits which is a dim- two dimensional one is the economic dimension the, what is the wage rate because that has direct implication but also in terms of the caste associations that uh, majority of the agricultural labor is a majbi sikh in malwa and uh, maja but in doba it's also balmiki to some extent and uh, that they are looked down upon as as, as lower 
Now, the, the Jat Sikh farmer has a contradiction in this. The teachings tell him not to obey caste distinctions, but in practice, there are caste discriminations. And this has led to clashes, even building separate Gurdwaras. But the farmers' organization, some of them, have been very acutely conscious of this. They have been trying to build unity between the farmers and the agriculture workers and trying to overcome these distinctions. And two factors have played a role in trying to weaken these distinctions. One is the entry of the left-wing movement. I mean, left-wing movement is not very strong in Punjab as much as it was in West Bengal and Kerala, but it was very strong. I mean, many people don't know that in the first Democratic Assembly election which took place in Punjab, 25% of the voters in the existing districts which can constitute East Punjab had voted for communists. As you know, recent as 1980, 15 communists were elected to Punjab's Assembly, which is 117. Almost 10% of the members were uh, communists. It's a different matter that after 1984, there has been a drastic decline, and that's a complex subject. But all this card remains there, and, and many of them have been very acutely conscious of this, that caste stands in the way of class uh, domination. Similarly, Sikh organizations have also, who are generally inspired by religion, that this has nothing to do with our religion. Why should, why should we not? And they had made attempts to overcome these caste barriers. So on one hand, the economic conflict was there, but on the other hand, your political and ideological and religious teachings are trying to overcome them. And it has worked in many ways. That there is one organization, the Mean Property Sangash Committee, which has worked in parts of Sangru district. They have been trying to claim the land, which is called the Shamlat, which is the common land, which legally the one third of that should be given to scheduled caste. But many of the large yacht farmers, they will use Benami, which means they will use an agriculture worker who works in their field in his name. They will ask for the lease and get the control and they will they will cultivate it. And the Mean Prapti Sanghash Committee was saying that this should be mobilized here the left organization has played a very important role, supported them, you know, even the farmers' organization, they supported them. And they have won in many villages. And the, the Dalit farmers, Dalit activists, uh, have been able to cultivate those small farms and able to, even if it's a small, I mean, you know, even if it's few acres, but they do it cooperatively. And they have been able to do this. And they have also extended support to this movement, partly because of the influence of the left-wing organization, but partly because they also see that big agro-business farms coming up, massively mechanizing all operations and cutting down the demand for agricultural labor. So for them, it is also an economic uh, uh, threat. You know? So that has led to this uh, building of new ties. And when they come to this platform in Delhi, they see that you know, Jats are also doing operations, which uh, they used to do it. And in the Langar cooking, obviously, there is no, and there's a new ties of solidarity and, and mutual admiration which are being built up. That obviously gives them a different sense of dignity and that, that provides further support, cementing ties between the Dalits and the, and the non-Dalits in, in the village economy and society. So I remember reading uh, about how farmers' uh, agitation during colonial rule yes. uh, which created uh, some really amazing uh, not just cultural but political symbols because Bhagat Singh's uncle was involved and um, the great song Pagdi Samal Jatta. Yes. So is this being evoked in this current agitation? Yes. This is what something is very interesting that history is being invoked in a massive way. Like Karl Marx once said that when movements are in crisis, they invoke the images of the past generations and the dead generations act on the memory of the present generation which I see actually being played here. And, and I'll give you two examples. One, which is already given, that Pagdi Sambhal Jatta is coming again and again, that what Ajit Singh did uh, is a, a Pagdi Sambhal Jatta is again, Pagdi is a sign of existence. It's a symbol of your existence. That is a threat, you know, which is economic, cultural, political, social, and, and that's what's happening during these, the, these laws. And second is that they celebrated the martyrdom of the Sahib Jadas, two younger sons of Guru Gobind Singh, the last 10th uh, Guru of the six. Now, one would think that an organization which is mainly centered on economic, why should they do this? Partly it was pragmatic because they were worried 
that many of them might go to the Gurdwara in Fatehgarh Sahib on in December, which have massive gathering, and they didn't want them to go back. But it was more than pragmatic because they had suddenly understood that invoking the memory of the Sahabjadas who was seven and nine year old, and they did not yield before the oppression. And what they did was also brought out new images that when these Sahabjadas were martyred, Malay Putla, who was a Muslim, who protested against this. And there were two Hindus, Baba Motira Mehra, who provided milk to the Guru's mother and children. Divan uh, uh, Totermal, who provided gold coins to buy land where he could be cremated. So they could see Muslim, Hindu, Sikh unity, and which they wanted to promote. So they appropriated those images of, from the past to strengthen this unity and, and, and a secular image. And it's also a criticism of the Hindu nationalist narrative. Because the Hindu nationalist narrative was trying to use the Sahabjada's martyrdom as a way of creating a tension against the Muslims that they were martyred and, under a Subha Sarhand who was a Muslim. They, by constructing this, that it was also a Nawab of Malir Kotla who was a Muslim who protested against this. And that's why the Malir Kotla is one only, only state or only, only region or only city area where Muslims are still in a majority. Because during the you know barbaric days of partition, when there was ethnic cleansing, both on the West Punjab, where Sikhs and Hindus were thrown out, and East Punjab, where the Muslims had to migrate. Malur Kotla was one place where Muslims didn't have to leave, because it was a part of Sikh consciousness that this is a place which stood with the Guru. So if a Muslim entered the Malur Kotla area, they were not attacked. So therefore, there is a concentration of Muslim population in Malayar Kotla to the extent that every time the MLA which is elected is Muslim, many times that MLA finds the birth in the Punjab cabinet. So Malayar Kotla had that association of, of secular, cross-cultural, cross-religious. So they used, you know, Ajit Singh, uh, Pagdi Samajata, but they also used these religious symbols, but in a different way from the Hindu nationalists who were trying to use this as a weapon against uh, Islam and, and Muslims. So that was a fantastic move. I thought so intelligent, so innovative, so progressive. So history is being invoked as, as a part of that struggle. Prime Minister Modi has said that many farmers' delegations from Punjab have come to see him and supported the laws. Plus, he has also been putting out, he went to the Gurdwara in Delhi and uh, he has been putting out statements saying the. I have very close associations with Sikhs and all that kind of thing. Obviously, that's a, that's an opportunity. That's a, that's an attempt to change the narrative and switch it to say not everyone is protesting. But what exactly is going on? Well, there are two things. One about this uh, farmers from Punjab who they say are coming to them and saying that those are fake organizations. I mean, the farmers organization which are organizing this protest has thoroughly exposed that. You know, one farmer who says that he comes, they looked at their organization. There's one person who, who's there. And uh, there is a farmer's organization in Maharashtra organized by Sharad Joshi, who has for a very long time argued for market entry into agriculture, but never in Punjab. So the claim that farmers from Punjab supported this is a total fake uh, claim. But on the question of um, uh, Modi going to the... Guru Teg Bahadur, uh, you know, to remember Guru Teg Bahadur in, in the Gurdwara is a complex issue. It's not that simple. It's complex because of these various reasons. One, Modi wants to give some kind of an image to the Sikh community, whose large number of them who are Sikh farmers, that I'm not opposed to them. So they, they, they are, I'm not seen as an anti-Sikh. Secondly, Guru Teg Bahadur is presented in Hindu nationalist narrative in a very different way. They presented him as the Hindi Chadar and that he protected Hinduism, that he gave his life to protect Hindu religion. But if you look at the narratives which the Guru Tegh Bahadur, he was protecting the religious rights, religious human rights of the Kashmiri Brahmins. And when Aurangzeb questioned him that, why are you protecting the interest of these people who are ideologically opposed to you? You believe in, you know, casteless society and Brahmins believe in caste hierarchies. Guru Teg Bahadur said that, no, my ideas might be opposed to that, but I am protecting their right to have their religious observation. In fact, uh, Banerjee, who's written on this, shows that when the body, dead body of Guru Teg Bahadur was brought, and the, the slogan was Taramdi Chadar, not Hindi Chadar. This is a Hindutva construction that he's a Hindi Chadar. 
So Guru Tegh Bahadur is kind of part of the Hindu nationalist narrative to say that it is Guru Tegh Bahadur and Guru Guru Har, Har Gobind, Guru Gobind Singh who protected Hindu religion, they are protectors. But even more important, it's a part of RSS ideology because RSS has three main heroes. Many people would know about it. Guru Gobind Singh, Shivaji and Maharana Pratap, warriors who protected. Shivaji and Maharana Pratap have a warrior image, but they do not have a moral and ethical dimension. Guru Gobind Singh has that also. He was a poet, he was a philosopher, and the religious dimension. So he is even bigger than Maharana Pratap. So RSS is faced with this contradiction, that you can't crush a movement which is led by six, because then you tear apart the whole idea that six are a part of Hindus. Okay? And of course, six resent this. They say we have a distinctive identity. That has been one of the tensions uh, behind that. So the going to the Gurdwara was a manifold meanings that I'm showing humility. I'm not being arrogant, that I'm being accused of, uh, you know, you know not, not showing sensitivity and I'm bowing before the Guru. And for his discomfort, the words which came out that day from the Gurbani, people say as a godly coincidence, was that you may do the practice, but if you have committed sins, the sins will go with you. And when he was moving out of the Gurdara, those words were coming up. That was a sphere indictment. And people saw this as a providential uh, intervention that those words came up from the recitation of the uh, Gurbani. So it was an attempt to show humility. It was an attempt to show that I'm not opposed to the Sikhs, but also a part of a larger narrative to keep Guru Tegh Bahadur as a part of the Hindu nationalist narrative, which was being undermined. And this the Punjabi farmer has recognized that it's an assault by uh, Hindu nationalism on the Sikh uh, cultural and religious identity, that they have recognized this. Yes, yes. The day this, um, he, he went to the Gurdwara, they were saying that, yes, it's good that you shown some humility. Uh, and that's good that they appreciated that because no one should uh, undermine, you know, if, if the prime minister of a country goes to a religious place and behaves like an ordinary uh, pilgrim and or, or ordinary devotee, that should be appreciated. And But they said that uh, that's not good enough, you know, that, you know, if you're really humble, you need to talk to us. You never bother to even invite us for a discussion. You, you tell your ministers, but you invite other farmers you know, uh, who are uh, close to the BJP Kisan wing to invite. The, the other day, he met uh, Siani and Harjit Garewal, who are part of the BJP Kisan wing, basically to know what the ground reality is. And But you have never bothered to visit the farmers. I mean, any prime minister of a country where such massive three lakh people, some people estimate more than are sitting there, would immediately call a meeting and, and discuss with them. So, you know, they, they understood that it is an attempt to show some modesty, some humility, and that should be appreciated. But that humility is very limited. It's very narrow and, and it's purely symbolic. And, and we welcome the symbolic part, but it has to be substantive. And if it has to be substantive, you need to ask us to talk to us and, and look at our demands. So the farmers organization understood this. So to uh, do an overview of the whole thing, we have a situation where Religious organizations and left organizations are protesting together. Yes. We have a situation, as you said, where new identities are emerging. Men are doing one thing, women are doing another. They are cleaning uh, bathrooms. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, even the caste dimension is at the moment at least, yes. for the moment at least, a little fluid. Yeah. Uh, we have... Um, you know, people coming together from all walks of life, a new kind of solidarity. Yes. So one way or the other, yeah. this will change Punjabi society in a major way. Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I, I'm very hopeful. I think that uh, this movement is the trigger for rethinking a lot of things about Punjabi society. And I'm hopeful that, that this will carry on. And... Uh, the point which you mentioned about the left wing and the religious organization coming together is also a very admirable one because after 1984, there has been a split. It wasn't there before that because I mentioned the 1980 assembly election. Akali Dal, CPI and CPM had jointly fought together that election and they narrowly missed it. Otherwise, there would have been a left wing government, left Akali government in Punjab and in the 1980 and the whole scenario in the 1980s might have been different. 
And that was split, partly because of the politics of the left parties, which was guided by Soviet Union, and Soviet Union had, you know, other issues, and partly misunderstanding on the question of religion. But their actual practice has led them to come together. And many of the suspicions have been, you know, overcome by this, that left is not necessarily opposed to our, you know, religious heritage, and they're able to see the left is able to also see that the people who are inspired by religion are also inspired by egalitarian traditions. So they are not necessarily opposed to our left vision. So this has brought them together and this would be very, very important. And going beyond this, you know, going beyond gender boundaries, caste boundaries and class boundaries and uh, interacting together, sharing work, I hope that this will be carried forward. This will be a major task, however this movement goes, my initial worry was that this will be repressed, that there will be mass army repression. And I was terribly worried that if that happens, God knows what will happen because there will be not few deaths, there will be thousands of deaths. And a Gurdura will be constructed there and it will become another na, you know, Nankana Sahib. But obviously government is not thinking of that. They have understood, their intelligence have told them that people are too determined, they will not be debted by this. They can't have a Tiananmen Square here. So they understood that you know, we have to have some kind of a negotiation. So my hope is that the new currents, new culture of solidarity, of, of respect for women, of, of, you know, breaking barriers of gender and caste will survive, if not entirely, maybe partially, but it could even go beyond that. It could say that if we could do that time, why can't we do it? And that will be a rejuvenation of real Punjabi egalitarian society, which we can hope, you know, will be more than the outcome on MSP and uh, procurement prices and procurement targets. Well, as you said, uh, they are here to fight till the very end. And it's an ex existential crisis. Uh, we don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, you have an adamant government on one side and determined farmers on the other. But uh, I think this can't go on. So presumably there will be some kind of uh, meeting ground. And uh, if the government backtracks at all, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't want to predict because, uh, you know, this is a dangerous idea yeah. to predict. But if at all the government backtracks, it'll be the second time they've backtracked. And even this, that one was on land acquisition laws. So yeah. the farmer's central place yes. in India yeah. is now stamped. Absolutely. Uh, that you cannot ignore agriculture and throw it to the wolves. Absolutely. And, and that's an experience one learned in West Bengal when the Bhattacharya was saying that agriculture is a thing of the past and, you know, we have to move forward. And agriculture has come at the center stage. The farmer has come at the center stage. And the progressive parties also need to reorient their thinking that economic development is not merely industrialization and GDP, you know, that we have to construct new paradigms of development. My understanding of how this will end is, let me share what I think. I think that the government will have to agree eventually to repeal of the laws, but it is a question of how it will be represented. My understanding is that farmers' organization will reach an understanding with the government that you repeal, you say repeal the laws, but you take the credit. So Modi will go on to the television that I love the farmers, I love the farmers, I love the farmers, I love the farmers, इसलिए मैंने उनकी बातें मान ली हम दोबारा मिलेंगे नए लाएंगे उनकी उनकी जो वेलफेयर है मेरे दिल में है आई इट इज एट माय सेंटर टू दिस दैट्स व्हाई मैं उनके साथ मेरे डिफरेंसेस होने के बाद भी मैंने उनकी बात तो द मीडिया विल प्ले दिस अगेन एंड अगेन इट विल बी प्रेजेंटेड एज अ विक्ट्री बट व्हाट एग्जैक्टली इट इज यू नो मोर मोर एस्ट्यूट पीपल विल बी एबल टू मेक मीनिंग्स आउट ऑफ दैट बट यू आर वेरी राइट दैट फार्मर हैज कम टू अ सेंटर स्टेज पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज हैव टू रीथिंक अबाउट देयर स्ट्रेटजीज about allowing multinational corporations, WTO, about foreign direct investment, acquisition of land, and, and farming being taken over by large industrialization, special economic zones. All that economic paradigm has to be seriously questioned in the light of this moment. That is the greatest contribution this most chance struggle is, is making to India's uh, reimagining. Thank you, Dr. Singh, uh, for your uh, views, which have established context and a historical uh, context also for us to understand because what we see every day on a daily basis is headlines and uh, not always uh, accurate ones, as you probably know, very distorted news often, uh, fake news also, but uh, that 
it is not merely an economic issue which is critical of course but it's also perhaps a societal and existential issue so uh, we hope this is something that our policy makers also will finally grasp that they've gone beyond just merely repealing laws thank you very much dr singh for the joining us at the wire talks yeah i appreciate i think that you've taken a major step in in, in opening up this negotiation and taking the opportunity to broaden the issue which is exactly what is needed at this time thank you that was dr pritam singh of oxford brooks university discussing the many complexities and the social and political dynamics of the farmers agitation currently going on You can check out this podcast and other interesting ones on the Wire website, the IVM podcast website, app or wherever else that you get your podcasts. Goodbye from me Siddharth Bhatia and the Wire Talks podcast team. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So everybody, please do help us out with our survey if you haven't filled it out yet. It's on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. This survey is really helpful for us. And, you know, fill out the survey completely and uh, we'll put you into a lucky draw and we will send you some IVM swag. And what a great week of episodes we had and what an eventful week we had. Let me run through some of the episode highlights really quickly. On Pesa Vesa, Samir Nair of Applause Entertainment was on to discuss the web series Scam 1992. Great conversation with Anupam was had. Do check that out. Bhavish Sumaya of Hasbro was on Advertising is Dead. On Positively Unlimited, Chitna is starting a new series from A to Z. This week, Align. Do check that out. And on Gabi CD, Farhad and Sunetra asked the question, what if they were straight? Interesting conversation. Definitely do check that out. I think you'll enjoy that. And one piece of news for you guys. Cyrus says is now live on YouTube every weekday at 10 a.m. If you go to our IVM podcast YouTube channel, you'll be able to catch us over there. And stay tuned for a lot more video content coming out in the next couple of weeks. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. Working Monday to Friday glued to your chair making you feel dull? Worry not. Get your 5-minute weekly dose of travel around the world with postcards from nowhere. Join me every Thursday. as i explore the strange obscure and fascinating parts of the world and bring out facets of travel you may not have thought of before you can find us on the ibm podcast app website or wherever you get your podcast from